Hey, how's it going, Champagne Sharks? Hope everyone's doing well. Just wanted to uh, do some quick house cleaning, let people know. Go to ChampagneSharks.com and you get access to all the links related to Champagne Sharks. You can go there and find it all. And you can find where we are on social media, our products, all that stuff. Also, Patreon benefits, which includes Discord server, book club night, movie night discussions, show notes, newsletter, and most importantly, bonus episodes. So definitely become a patron for $5 a month at patreon.com forward slash champagne sharks. And without further ado, here is the episode. Take care. Hey, how's it going, Champagne Sharks? Uh, we have two returning guests, but who have never been on the show together. But I need to get something out of this experience that uh, we all three uh, experience. And it's a play called Fat Ham. And I saw it with M2 me. And then uh, Josh saw it. When did you see it, Josh? Uh, I saw it like a week ago, I want to say. Uh, yeah. Actually, no, it was like it was on Friday. I saw it just this past Friday. So it's, oh, yeah, it's still so, pretty fresh in my memory. So it wasn't even okay. uh, a whole week. But yeah. yeah, I'll let you guys um, introduce yourselves. Uh, let me start with them two, May. Um, two, May, I'm sure everyone who listens to the show knows who you are. But just in the case this is anybody's first episode, just give people a quick breakdown of uh, who you are. Hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Tuma Gant. I'm a filmmaker, dramatist, and also film professor. Um, yeah, and artists and things like that. Yeah. And I'm happy to be back on. Yeah, happy to have you. Josh, if you don't mind just uh, introducing the people and know who you are. Sweet. Yeah, uh, I'm Josh Borman. Uh, I am the co-host of a show called The Worst of All Possible Worlds. Uh, and, you know, Trevor, you've been on our show before. I've been on your before. Or I've been on your show before. And uh, yeah, really excited to be back and talk about this fucking terrible play. Now, there was a perverse part of me that was hoping um, Josh should be one of the white people who likes this play. <laughs> uh, just just because I want to pick the brain of somebody but also, I feel like it would be too painful to talk to someone who like the, you know, like I'd never be able to look at Josh the same again. So, <laughs> I mean, I, no. I, I, yeah, I think that like if you have questions at different points about like what was this thing trying to do to uh, your average, I guess, white person, I might be able to shed some light, even if it's not my own personal opinion necessarily. Because there, there were a few things about this play where I was like, I see what it's going for here, even though it fails to do that. Um, but yeah, no, I agree that somebody who's like totally in the tank. For this thing would most likely be deeply cringe. I feel like this play was written by a human bot. What I mean by that is like, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, AI and machine learning and stuff, they have to kind of get inputs, you know, to kind of simulate something realistic. Like no matter how well you program the algorithm, it needs some observation of like, you know, human um, behavior and some, you know, like, so for example, uh, I don't know how many people know this, but those captures and all the stuff that they have, you know, on Google, whenever you sign into things and they make you click the lights and the hills and all mm -hmm. that stuff, or they make you type in what the um, scribble is because they're trying to use you to train the, their AI. So right. uh, we're all part of this giant experiment and it needs like a lot, a lot of observation of um, correct um, behavior, but also even the ways in which you're wrong, you know, kind of help, uh, you know, program it and whatever. And I feel like this is the kind of thing that's written by AI, like like someone just fed in Strange Loop. They fed in like maybe Hamilton. They fed in like a bunch of, you know, things. They fed in Shakespeare's kinda... Hamlet, obviously. Yeah, exactly. Ham Hamlet, uh, you, you know, like... Um, all those like plays and TV shows that are about quote unquote reclaiming something white that was never, you know, black in the first place, you know, like what they do with Lovecraft Country. I feel like there was a little bit of that in there. Yeah. And none of it cohered into anything like it felt like there's nothing wrong with taking from like four or five different things that are in like the cultural ether but you have to find a way to synthesize them and make them work and this is this just felt like an unfinished ai just slapped together like five things that observed didn't try to make them cohere at all that's yeah that's my take yeah i mean i think maybe we should summarize the play for the people at some point but i i think i i'm totally with you trevor and i think I think it's an example of whether it's conscious or subconscious that the playwright knows 
actually to make a play like that successful, he kind of has to synthesize yeah. little things that are in the popular discourse. And then also like, and then keep it ominous. Like, I think the thing, and we can get to it, that, I, I, that show pissed me off on multiple levels, but I, I felt like the ending of the show, we can get to that later, mm. was um, prime example that the show really committed to nothing um, and I think that's purposeful. And I think that's really interesting for this age where all these people seem to act like they have these deep fucking convictions, but they can't write a fucking play that has like, you know, a solid statement about something, you know, <laughs> like it's so weird. They're so like they're trying. mad at everybody I else. I don't think they're trying to. That's what I'm feel- saying. Yeah. But that's what I'm saying. They're yeah. not trying it. And, and it's, but, but they are the same people who shit on people for like, Oh, you're being wishy-washy. Oh, why are you not supporting people? Why are you not? And I'm like, you write wishy-washy plays. Get the fuck out of here. You know? <laughs> but but to them, wishy-washy means something totally different than it does to us. Because to them, the point of art is to uh, is self-esteem management. You know what I mean? Yeah. So so it's like to them, wishy-washy means you weren't overt enough in affirming. You know, um, the things that need to be affirmed. You didn't affirm POC. You didn't affirm dark-skinned people versus light-skinned people. Like, they want it just beaten over the head. Like, I saw this um, show the other day. I was just kind of curious about what it was like. It was already, it's already canceled, but it's an Ava DuVernay produced show called Naomi. It's a black woman superhero show. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's on Mm -hmm. HBO Max. And I was just kind of curious because it was in the HBO Max selection uh, thing. So, I, I turned it on in the first five minutes, I swear, is just like, hey, Naomi, how you doing? Got, I heard you got A's, all A's again. <laughs> yeah, well, you know. Yeah. And it was talking in exposition. Like, no one talks like this. It goes, yeah. hey, well, y'all, yes. it's, Na- it's Naomi who has the best Superman fan site in the whole school. Th- that's how this play started off, too. It yeah. was very, very similar where, like, I mean, we might as well just dive into because, again, I've got a lot of notes here. So if need be, I can just kind of guide us through like recapping it beat by beat. Oh, yeah, Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Please, please do. But I mean, like I watched Top Gun, the original, uh, a couple weeks before. And that's something that's totally up its own protagonist ass. But Mm -hmm. in comparison, it's so much more... uh, Subtle, because at least it comes up in what seems like natural conversation. Like, you know, it's, it's like someone says, uh, hey, Maverick, who graduated third from, third from <laughs> uh, yeah. class and did this, 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 this you know. Yeah. Uh, Top Gun Academy, Top Gun that's not- where we are. <laughs> <laughs> but Top Gun's also not socially self-important. At the end of the day, yeah, you know, even for all of its, you know, weird um kind of off propaganda during the cold war it's pretty silly at the end of the fucking day you know it's a it's a male virility well and also like you say it's a um it, it's, it's definitely a very homoerotic movie oh the original but, absolutely yeah, yeah original but fat ham is so self-important and yeah, that's yeah. what's weird to me yes we're like these people are so self-important yet they commit to no statements other than like be joyful. <laughs> no, no. They commit to statements. Uh, being fat is awesome. Being queer is awesome. Being black is Even awesome. That, but that's so thin. Right. It's oh, it's so, so thin. thin. It's so thin. But, but to them, it's thick. To them, that's the whole <laughs> That's the whole meal. It, it's crazy. <laughs> right. it's, I totally, it's, it's dummy for thick. It's the carbs, fact. right? It's the carbs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you, you, you're absolutely right. Um, if, if, if I, I, <laughs> when I got into the theater to start watching, I had actually just gotten back from, I had been down at Washington Square Park because this, the day that I saw the episode was the day that that Supreme Court decision dropped, um, making abortion illegal in a lot of states. So, uh, fair to say that a lot of people were not doing well. Um, and I usually try not to like snoop over the shoulders of people, but for some reason, the woman right in front of me, I just noticed that she was writing, uh, something in her phone and she was typing and I quote, I've spent the day fighting with Bernie bros and anti-choice Catholics. 
cakes. Ooh, but right. now I'm seeing fat ham. So this will be exactly what I need. And so, I, you know, one thing that we talk about a lot on our show is the question of like, who is this for? This show is for that lady. It is for her specifically, I think. <laughs> Do you ever wonder, like, there but for the grace of God go I, like, you know, going to school, you know, uh, you're in you're in academia, M2, May, you know, like, being on the internet, like, we could have been one of those people. But then part of me thinks, would I just be, like, way happier? Like, I would just be so easily pleased by everything. Like, they must have I, all I, have, like, I, I have blood. that thought all the time. Yeah, I'd be thinking about it. I mean, yeah. I wouldn't want to do it, but I just sometimes wonder, like, imagine being the person that could be pleased by this. Like, like you know, your bar being that low. It's just, I don't know. But but this play, right? Uh, I'm going to start with a summary. Mm-hmm. Um, but I went in there. I like going into plays and TV shows and movies if I can, knowing nothing. So I, all I knew it was called Fat Ham. And I forgot when I figured it out. It was relatively early, like about five or 10 minutes in, um, still probably later than I should have, but I was sitting there and then it clicked to me. I was like, oh my God, is this about a fat Hamlet? Like, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I'm like, no. This can't That's the be title. Worse. That's the title of the play. Yeah. I'm like, is this Hamlet? And I said, oh wait, this is fat ham? But I'm like, there has to be more to this than just being a fat black version of Hamlet. But Pretty much what it was. And it was. Yeah. And, 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 and I don't know what it was trying to say. I don't know if it was trying to be body part. I, I mean, I, I don't know. And then I think the queerness, okay, the blackness, the fatness, the queerness. I'm, I'm telling you, I just think it was just trying to take a lot from Strange Loop. And then there was also like the idea of reclaiming something. So, you know, I was thinking like Hamilton, like, oh, we're reclaiming the founding fathers and making them ours. Oh, we're yeah. taking H.P. Uh, Lovecraft and making it making it ours and quote unquote uh, reclaiming it, which makes no sense because I don't know how you can claim something that was ne- reclaim something that was never originally yours. But for the most part, it's just Hamlet, but with a lot of tongue in cheek kind of mm-hmm. Easter eggs, very self pleased at itself for. I'm not sure why it's so pleased with itself. It's very pleased with itself. Yeah. You know, and there is a tradition of um, people of color doing versions of European classics and readapting them. Like there was the one in the, in the aughts, uh, the drowning crow, which was a black adaptation of the seagull by, by Chekhov. I know it because I was actually in a, an original reading of it. Is it good? Uh, no, it sucks. Oh, okay. Um, and, uh, what's his name started in Anthony Mackie actually started in it, um, back in it, it was on Broadway in like, I think Oh five or something like hmm. that. And it's not very good. It's just, it's just the seagull with like modern day black language. It's, it's, and I think it actually is probably a quiet inspiration of a lot of shit like fat ham because it, it, it does it does i forget the who's the woman who wrote it she's someone who's known regina uh Reg, regina taylor um she wrote it and and she's she's like someone in the, in the theater community who has you know a kind of reputable rep, rep, uh you know name so oh i'm looking at this now that, it got started in chicago apparently yeah and, uh, it got started in chicago then there was a yeah the, I did a reading of it at Baltimore Center Stage. Oh, okay. Either 03 or 04, Marion McClinton, who was, you know, the the second August Wilson director, directed it. Um, he directed it. You know, it had a lot behind it. But there's always, there's been this thing that's existed and Fat huh. Ham kind of slides itself in there. But I think Fat Ham goes to another level. Like, I thought the Dryden Curtis wasn't very imaginative. Like, I love the seagull. I'm a big Chekhov fan. But I found it like, you're not really doing anything. Let's just fucking act Chekhov with, with Black people and call it a fucking day. You, you didn't really add anything. Um, uh, here's another example. How about uh, Carmen Jones? I feel like that's an ex- example of taking something European and making it Black. You know, it's funny. That's a movie to me that I find kind of flawed. But Same. Compared to this, oh my god! <laughs> oh no, dude, it's 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 far beyond, dude. Like I wouldn't, or like the Wiz. Oh, yeah, yeah. The, this is a great one. The Wiz, you know, but, the Wiz is probably you know classically the 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 the, 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 the high mark. But I think these 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 shows are a little different because I think Chekhov and Shakespeare hold a certain you know in the theater world they have this this reference. Weight. 
Yeah. 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 Because like, you know, like when I was, you know, I don't know if people know, like I studied, you know, classical acting and, you know, your first year you do a lot of American plays typically, but then like your checkoff and your Shakespeare years are the years you cut your teeth. And those are the years that you can prove that you're really an actor. So checkoff and Shakespeare kind of hold these like these like high levels, you know, and I think him doing a thing on and, and and it's not just like he did. He didn't do Midsummer Night's Dream also. He motherfucker did Hamlet. Well, right, exactly. <laughs> I mean, to, to the point of the Wiz, like that, that part of the reason that the Wiz is, is, is so ripe for a fun adaptation is that the Wizard of Oz is fun. Hamlet is not. No, <laughs> it's long, <laughs> complicated, and it, it could be a chore. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I've, I've seen Hamlet twice you know, in my life, you know, and one time was really a chore. The second time was like less of a chore. Well, I, uh, (laughs) my history with Hamlet is I did a college production of it. I was assistant director on it. And that was like, as is to be expected from a college production, a horrible goddamn production. And even so, Hamlet has always been a really interesting play for me because it is definitely of all of Shakespeare's plays. It is one of the ones that is the most I guess, inward facing in a lot of ways, right? Like you have this protagonist who's a real enigma, but which again, (laughs) such a strange choice to do in this kind of an adaptation due to who that character is. But um, it, it, I have seen a lot of different productions of Hamlet. And so as soon as I grokked onto what the thing was doing, which was right away, actually, because in the playbill, there was a note that was like, this isn't just Hamlet. <laughs> the, the, the oh, right right I it hated like, that thing. It was like, no, it, yeah, it is. It is. Come on. It's the same thing we said. Uh, does anybody have it in front of them that they can read it? No. And I can I can go find it real quick if if, if it's useful. Um, it's definitely yeah, around I here think, somewhere. Uh, yeah, actually, no, I know exactly where mine is. Let, let me just go get mine real quick. I know exactly where it is. Hold on. Got these playbills. Wrong show. Oh, God. Yeah. I mean, I didn't like that show either, but that show didn't piss me off as much as it did. Yeah, just, no, because because that was the thing, too, bored right? me. <laughs> yeah. And there were a couple moments where I was like, oh, that's nice. Yeah, um, that's cute. Yes. There were, there were a few annoying moments, like 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 the barbershop moment really pissed me yeah, off. If yeah. I, I thought of a colored man, but yeah. I got over it. Yeah, yeah, I just didn't like it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, nice, thoughts, got it. Yeah, thoughts of a colored man was really rough around the edges, but it was like I'm okay with a lot of other people's. As in, like I saw some people who went to it and really liked it, and I think it was one of those um, plays where you know a lot of plays claim. Like, um, you know, uh, Jeremy Harris was claiming that he was bringing people who don't normally go to Broadway to Broadway and all this stuff. And that was like a load of crap, you know, like like he's trying to make it seem like regular salty deer black people were, you know, going. But that's a colored man. I actually heard they had a really good like street team. Like they went to barbershops. They did all this stuff. And they actually, to me, did get a lot of, um, you know, um, Regular salt of the earth black people up in up in there. Yeah, I'm not I mean, sure exactly it was, it what was kind of full crowd. of normies the night that I went. It was yeah, just like normies is a good word for it. And and I don't feel like this thing um, accomplishes that either. I mean, I'm not sure if it's trying to. I mean, too, it's. Too I don't it's, think he cares. Yeah, I don't think he cares. You know. Yeah. What do you, uh, What do you think he's actually trying to do here? Because it, it'll be let's we should read this note from the playwright and then unpack it. Because like yeah, yeah. I didn't buy this for a minute, and I'm wondering what he's actually trying to do here. Um, do you know what it reminds me of? Right, um, the Joker movie. Right, a lot of people were trying to analyze <laughs> the politics of the Joker, but I'm like, this thing doesn't have any politics because it's just a dopey guy who is just recreating Taxi Driver, um, King of Comedy, and Fight Club, and because each of those is political, um, you know he's accidentally making something political because he's just aping them and, you know, without any actual, and he said himself that the movie's not political and a lot of people were like, he's just being humble. Like, you know, there were stories like that. I'm like, no, this guy was just like, you know, um, just regurgitating like other movies and I feel like that's what this guy's doing. He's just saying statements that, you know, are in vogue, whether they make sense or not. So I think there's two statements he's, trying to simultaneously say but they don't go together one is like the whole thing that's very popular about subverting like oh uh i'm sick of slave movies i want to do a movie about black joy and i want to do a movie about you know being soft so people are taking like classically like depressing um black settings and then making something surprisingly like you know um 
happy about it, you know? And then the other thing is like reclaiming things that black people were supposedly quote unquote excluded from. Like this is kind of thing where you, you know, the whole Bridgerton thing and all these different things where people acting like just being true to history somehow is excluding them. Like they were supposed to be in, uh, Oliver Twist, but they missed their in, but black people missed their invite somehow. It's just, this weird mindset. I don't know where it's it comes so, from. It's so absurd. It's so absurd. I, I can tell you exactly what it comes from. It's, it's it's something that's dodged England for years and and people of color in England. Oh, there boy. is an envy. <laughs> no, it's true. There is an envy that they they still see the Western canon as the elite canon. Oh yeah, mm, totally. Right? And and because they have that envy, they create like it's almost like a it's almost like a David Lynch Lost Highway Mulholland Drive delusion where they like literally create a world in their brain where that makes sense. But yeah. like when you look at it, like in Lost Highway, you look at the world, you're like, this doesn't make any fucking sense. This is absolutely absurd, bro. It does not make any sense, but they've convinced themselves that it makes sense. They treat the Western canon and uh, Western history, not even just like the canon, but the literal history as like some cool party. They uh, weren't allowed. Like there was a velvet rope and they didn't get in. Right. They're like mad about it. But there's so many black stories or whatever that you could you know, find and take, but they don't have any, they don't see any value in that. And right. I think no. what this guy is doing, he's, he's trying to combine those two trends, uh, the whole Bridgerton thing, but also the black joy. So it ends up not making sense because it's almost like he's saying, oh, black people don't have to be tragic. We're not going to do that today. We're going to have joy, but he's doing it with a white tragedy. So it makes no, no sense because it would make sense to me if he did something like Roots or something that was like a tragic black thing, like Raising the Sun. And then he's like, oh, I'm sick of things being tragic for black people. Uh-uh, we're not doing that today. This right. time Raising the Sun's going to end with joy. I mean, I think it would be a sucky idea, but <laughs> it would at least be coherent. But he's doing this thing where he's almost acting like Hamlet is a, was always a black play or that somehow right. it was making a statement on black people that he's somehow subverting and it just makes it's just confusing you, you, you know what i'm trying to say it makes no sense to so try and describe something that makes no sense makes me feel like i'm not making sense <laughs> can you so, so can, trevor can you read the um yeah. the I, I i also don't remember it okay i, I, I want to hear it again so it says a note from the playwright is an ain't i don't know if that's a play on something or what or are we just trying to use ebonics to you know Cold switch and sound and impress the white I think people. that's it. No, I, yeah. I think that's actually just it. I think it's I it's agree. like I'm I'm a I'm a white guy sitting in this in this theater. I'm opening this thing up. Is an A and so oh, wow, this is gonna be a little different from what I normally oh, I'm see. I'm getting something authentic. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah. Ooh. <laughs> uh, this ain't Shakespeare. Don't get me wrong. I love Shakespeare. This just ain't him. This ain't a tragedy. It literally is him. Yeah. It literally yeah. is. Totally. Totally. Yeah. And, and, and this is what I mean when I say, like, he's trying to subvert something, but it makes no sense. This ain't a tragedy. While I appreciate and weep through tragedies on a daily basis, both imagined and real, this play is not that. Okay, but why are you making this not a tragedy? It's, it's kind yeah, of what, what, what's right. confusing me. And he seems to be pretending he's doing it for <laughs> racial reasons. But, uh, you know, Hamlet, even if he did Othello and somehow tried to give Othello a happy ending, at least he can say there's kind of racial reason yeah. behind it. That's a really funny yeah. idea. And Hamlet, yeah, because and Hamlet has no historical racism in it. Like, it'd be no. one thing if Hamlet, you know, had this, like, you know, if it was maybe something like uh, Merchant, Merchant of Venice, Venice right, that has, right, like, right, right, with, right. Like, with, like, with like Jews. I can understand that. But like, literally, Hamlet has nothing, nothing in it, you at know, all. <laughs> at all. This is a play about families stuck in a few cycles that their youngest members discover they can break. In real time, we will see family cycles dissolve to make room for something else to grow. This play is offering tenderness next to softness. How are they two oh. different things? Oh. I don't understand. I love it when tenderness is offered next to softness. <laughs> softness. <laughs> Basically, play, you, 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 you have a glop that just kind of falls down. <laughs> <laughs> this play is offering tenderness next to softness as a practice of living. This Sorry. Play, no, no, no. Hold on. Read that again. That, what does that mean? Nothing. This <laughs> play is offering tenderness next to softness as a practice of living. Hell yes, dude. <laughs> uh, actually, I'll tell you what I think it means. I think it means this is like blackness, but without the stuff that scares you. Like, Ooh. you know, gangster rapping yeah. and, you know, 
uh, straight black men being, you know, scary. I feel like that's kind of also what also to- firmness because like, think about it, like softness and tenderness is the opposite of like firm, right? Mm, yeah. And black, you know, and black theater historically, Amir Baraka. At its most like militant, say Amir Baraka, Black Arts Movement is super firm, yeah. right? You leave Dutchmen and things like that with a real firm idea of the political world and the social world. And then maybe like August Wilson is not as firm as a Baraka, but it's pretty fucking firm. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, you've, you've in that case, these are stories told through the lives of people who feel like real people, but you still come away from it understanding why capitalism yeah. is destroying our lives. Like, yeah, right. And it's really firm. So now I, I, I think he's for me, that's previewing the lack of any kind of real commitment. He's kind of mm. even if it's conscious or subconscious, I think he's kind of like letting us know, you know, I think you're not really going to get anything firm. I think there's also something like uh, sexual in there, too, because it's like, you know, tender and soft is kind of like a flaccid penis. You know what I mean? And a lot of those people that um, you brought up, in addition to being like uh, ideologically firm or, you know, like in terms of insight, they have a virility to yeah. the, the work and some of the better Ooh. work. There's something where it's like, okay, this man here is having the struggles of a, of a, of a, of a man. Uh, uh, to keep using the popular example, like uh, raising the son, is somebody really struggling to be a, be a man in the traditional uh, sense, whether he uh, achieves it or not is, you know, a different story or whether it's a toxic pursuit, but there is a, lot of virility that comes in the um you know performance similar to like streetcar n- named desire you know which is not black but i think i'm just thinking of things that have a lot of virility and i feel like tender mm. and soft kind of this you think okay this is it's gonna be impotent you know uh if we're using uh sexual analogies this there's, there's impotence to this you know nothing's gonna penetrate you you know don't 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 worry about that you, you're not gonna feel emotionally raped from from this because we can't get it up you know don't don't worry yeah it's 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 campy. It's uh whatever. Um, this play is celebrating blackness that is traditional and weird and lonely and happy and grieving and honest and frightened and brave and sexy and churchified and liberated and poetic. Huh? Yeah. Huh? I got nothing. It's just that's just <laughs> yeah. Just, that's, that that is word salad by def, by definition. Oh yeah, for sure. Uh, this is this is buzzword salad because I feel like it's not just word salad, <laughs> word but it's salad. words. That's it's great. words that are very much in vogue. You know what I mean? Buzzword salad, yeah. a buzz feed, if you will. <laughs> a buzz. <laughs> We're being buzz fed. <laughs> I hope you love this buzz fed. <laughs> I hope you love this Buffet play. Buffet of feeding. I love this play, not because I wrote it. And I hate that he's writing like with these kind of fakey bonics, like, you know, uh, apostrophe cause. I love this play, not because I wrote it. I love it because it makes me laugh and cry and sing and all of the things I hope you feel unencumbered to experience. And this is very nitpicky, but they misspelled unencumbered. Uh, it's supposed to be U-N-E-N-C-U-M and it's U-N-I-N-C-U-M. Unencumbered? Um, it's I'm spelled sure. in there with an I. I yeah, it's spelled with an I. What? Okay. Uh, I'm 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 not crazy, right? It's un it's unencumbered, right? Uh, unencumbered yeah. is how it is correctly spelled. Yeah, U-N-E. This is, yeah, this is U N I N. And I was telling uh, M two me after we saw, I'm like, this right there is representative of the whole show. Like, how many yes. eyes did this see and nobody noticed? And I'm like, nobody really cares. People are treating this. I hate to say it, but people are treating it like um my kid. Did, did this you know fucked up ashtray and it's lumpy or you know i've used an example many times or, or you know a kid comes home from like second grade art class and draws you, gives you a picture of the family and it, it looks all mutated but you just put it up because you know he's in second grade you gotta have lower expectations you're not, you're not gonna nitpick the shading like the lighting hit wrong what were you doing you're not gonna, and i feel like that's kind of this i feel like they just let them do whatever like I, I just can't believe anybody was paying attention, uh, you know, as far as proofreading this thing. If they had an editor or the proofreader would have missed un, unencumbered it, unless they weren't really caring, you know, what was in there. Yeah. Or, or, or maybe they thought it was some kind of a uh, Ebonics thing. Like, no, the, no, the it, wrote, you know that's, that's just a typo. I mean, look, like, they let Amanda Gorman become famous. And she says shit in her poetry that make, <laughs> oh, make no yeah. damn sense. So, no, but I, 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 it's funny. I was talking to a friend about this and 
I, I think there's a way they also with black people let that shit happen and they know that shit don't make no sense. And they think it's cute. They all oh, look at the Negroes trying to be poetic, even though it's wrong, but whatever. You know, I think I think it's 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 it's, it's really embarrassing that they don't notice it, that they're just like weird novelty people and they let you be like literally grammatically incorrect. When you like in the moment you're supposed to be. That's one thing if you're like doing a play on words, you know, like somebody like but like people, people like Langston Hughes or like Zora Neale Hurston, they were fucking super literate. Yeah, and so extremely they, so precise can, with language, right? Yeah, and you could tell when they were doing some like funny shit or when they were like, you know, like, you know, you, you could tell when they were being off. They would never make a mistake like that. Yeah, yeah. And if if they caught if like the early uh you know galley of the playbill came out or whatever and they saw that fucking typo in their note they would be like you need to fix this yo right fucking said, fix this shit who, who did <laughs> yeah, that yeah you know, Langston yeah and Langston and i'm like what the hell get the fuck out of here with that <laughs> baldwin come on you think he would have did that yeah right hell no but but how do you think they got through do you think like no one really read it or they read it and noticed it but just didn't care because they're like oh i, I think, think it's the second yeah, I think he probably submitted a version of it with the typo in it. And rather than be, I mean, if, if we really want to get into the weeds here, I do actually think that this might reflect sort of what you guys were saying about the, the, the creative process here, where normally somebody would submit something like that and the note would be, hey, there's a typo here. Why don't we fix that real quick? But I think that maybe, maybe, again, and this might be reading more into it than is really there, but I do think that on some level that the artistic... um leaders at a lot of primarily white institutions are afraid on some level of giving the criticism, giving the notes that are about the actual artistic integrity of a given thing out totally of agree. fear that they are going to come across as being imperious or unwoke or, you know, that sort of thing. And in fairness, there are some people who are incredibly racist who do death by a thousand cuts to, you know, exclude people from their institutions. But it is an entirely different thing when it's like, I don't know if I can correct this typo because is he going to be mad about it? You know, it's just like, yeah. Does that make any sense? Totally. Because oh. I, so, so I've heard a few things about a lot of these like plays that we've seen that have come about, um, like, you know, Fat Ham and, and I've heard like they've kind of zipped through the developmental process mm. when it comes to plays. Like they don't get the same kind of scrutiny and i think there is this thing because of you know the we see you movement and mm -hmm. all that where they're kind of just like well does it really matter at this point if we like give it rigorous development it doesn't if yeah. anything it might make us look better it's representation behind yeah and also we get behind you yeah i don't yeah. really understand the black voice you know what I'm saying? So I can't really criticize you when mm -hmm. I'm kind of like, I oh, don't know, man. There is a certain level where a play is a play. Yes, yes. <laughs> and God, if you know yes. enough about theater, you could go, this doesn't work. Because I also I think in don't... the weird way they thought it was authentic, too, to have misspelled, you know, kind of like Brian thought it gave some character to it. It made it seem more authentic. But isn't that authentic, racist, authentic, bro? Black. Oh, totally. <laughs> it's, totally. So, it's so racist. <laughs> Josh, I cut you off. What were you saying? Oh, no, I was just going to say that. Um, oh God, let me see if I can get it back. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. <laughs> was, I'm just looking at my notes, too. There's probably um, a response to encumbered and the whole um, being afraid to. Developmental um, process development and process, and all that. things oh, yeah, of that nature. Um, in the, the, the We See You White American Theater and all that stuff. Oh, oh, in a good play versus a bad play. Right. <laughs> um, throughout this thing, I was. And I think we, we should probably uh, pivot into talking a little bit about the actual content of the play. And maybe I can just use some specific examples here of like things that I found frustrating, right? Because at the beginning of the play, um, you've got basically the Hamlet equivalent. Uh, his name is Juicy in this play. And um, he's coming out and he's talking with a friend who's just openly watching porn on his computer. And is like, yeah, man, I jacked off to this. And th this scene, this, I don't know about you guys, but this first scene to me, which is supposed to be kind of setting up the, you know, Ghost of the Dead Father coming back in the realm of Hamlet, that sort of thing. I was like, this sucks. Like, first of all, this character, not the, I don't think it was the actor's fault. The actor was giving it his absolute best, but the character as written was deeply fucking annoying. This was basically oh, the yeah. Horatio equivalent character. And it's like, 
what are you trying to establish right now? What are you setting up? Are you setting up that like, oh, all these other guys are just about jerking it to porn and he isn't like that because he's not over sex like the rest of these guys. Like, what the fuck is this trying to do here? I'm you not, you know, sure. you, you know who he reminded me of? He the reminded guy? me of. John yeah, the, the 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 Horatio. No, yeah. An, no, Anthony Ramos, who played Mars Blackman in um the She's Gotta Have It Netflix reboot. Mm-hmm. You know, it's crazy. I, I was gonna say John Leguizamo, but you said Anthony Ramos, but Anthony Ramos reminds me of John Leguizamo too. No, and I was gonna say so, but that thing Ramos is doing a bad version of Leguizamo oh, for sure. that. But yeah, remember, Ramos was in Hamilton, right? That's where Anthony Ramos and he oh, I didn't see he? him in Hamilton, oh. yeah, but. I think I've seen him act in. He's yeah, he never was, really different. He was uh, Philip Hamilton in Hamilton. I saw it with the original yeah. Broadway cast, so I do remember that. Before. Mm, and I just know. That's been a lot. A, so like, so to me, it was, I, it, it goes into, to me, this guy's consciousness, the writer. Was it James, Ill James is his name? Is that the, the I writer? I think it's pronounced I Ams, maybe, but it uh, looks like I James Ams. James, I, James, I am. But it's James yeah, I Ams. I James think, I yeah. Ams. James I Ams, um, kind of like, like his consciousness of like, um, ripping from these big pieces, which I honestly, the more that I think about it, I think it was really deliberate that he did this, like strength, and not just like in a deliberate, in a kind of like, um, let me try to be like a strange loop, grab something from Hamilton, grab something from Hamlet to like get attention. I think he even had maybe some bigger intentions uh, with it because it's mm. so much. Like he's uh, grabbing forgot, from so much. I forgot mm-hmm. something else that I think is pretty blatantly in there. It's Tyler Perry. It's very yeah. much yeah. trying to be like Tyler Perry yeah. as, yes. as, as well, for sure. Yeah, Tyler he's Perry writes real life, so guys. <laughs> <laughs> but he's grabbing so much and like but yeah that character annoyed i mean my experience with the play was like when it opened i knew within five minutes yeah. i was i was going yeah. to not like it um based just on i thought the writing it was so like weirdly on the nose even more than a lot of this writing i feel is on the nose these days but it's so on the nose what i wasn't prepared for though was like it's like big statement moments to be so fucking absurd we can get to those later and disconnected uh, from the remainder of the play like those moments didn't get set up in any meaningful way and so it just felt like here's a big moment yeah Um, nothing was earned yeah and in another i think another thing uh m2 made to that point of like the stuff that's just like there and it's like hey here's some more stuff here's some more exposition here's (laughs) another thing that's happening (laughs) is that when um the ghost of Hamlet's dad, you know, or King Hamlet and, you know, the original play. I don't remember their names in this version, so I'm just going to use the names from actual yeah. Hamlet. All I remember is Juicy. Juicy. That's I remember it. Juicy and that's it. Yeah. Um, so uh, when King Hamlet comes out, um, we, we are now treated to just a wealth of stereotypes about bad black fathers. Uh, plus, he's like yeah. ultra violent on top of that as well, which I think it was trying to do like a high pitched satirical thing where it was like, this guy is over the top in a number of extreme ways that are are so extreme that it like pushes the boundaries of what even believable is. But again, there's this weird tonal thing that's going on where it's like, am I supposed to take this character seriously? Because if I am, this guy is so fucking bad that I think I should fear him, hate him. I'm not really sure what my reaction to him should be. Well, that's the big problem I found was that a lot of people in this felt like they were all acting in different things mm-hmm. because there were a lot of these moments of like darkness and flashes of like, you know, uh, something really gross, like with, like with the father slash uncle. And it's like, like you said, how abusive was his father or right. what's up with this uncle or if this uncle did kill the father. Like there's some things that kind of almost have to be a tragedy. Like how are you going to have something about an abusive father? And then his, um, brother who may have killed him and bedded the mother like some things don't really lend themselves to not being tragic so it's just very weird that he chose this one i mean like there's some other tragic stuff where all you have to do is change one or two things and it didn't have to end you know like, like, like for example uh romeo and juliet that's something that's very easy to turn from a tragedy to a happy ending by just not right. having him drink the poison you know right. but right. with this with hamlet it's so baked into the very essence of the play how the fucked upness of it you know and, and once it committed to the premise of yeah i'm the ghost of your um father who's 
tasking you with proving your manhood and killing your uh, uncle. You know, can you do it? Like, I just don't see. And then when they commit to having the father be abusive and the uncle be whatever, because that guy, he gave it his all, you know, and he really showed a lot of menace. And the guy's even yeah. physically abusing uh, the boy. Yeah. For it to suddenly end with, it's like, it's joy time. It's like, oh, what? Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And suddenly the actor playing the father slash brother is cleaning up and is nice now. So I'm like, wait a minute. Another example of nothing being earned. If you showed the work of Hamlet working with the father, I mean, I mean, working with the uncle to find a common ground to make him maybe less homophobic, to make mm. him, you know, find something. But that was like actual writing. Yes. It's a kind of understanding of how humans work. Yes. That's too much work. We're just going to have him fake die. They magically resurrect. And now he's cool. Oh, man. Now he's fine with, with, with the drag show. Uh, something like, is he still the same guy? I was trying to figure out, are we watching the act? Are we supposed to be watching the actor now? Oh, he's still supposed to be that character. And if he's yeah. the same character, why is he so cool now? Like, <laughs> and, yeah. and I would say the other, the other, to the other point, and I would just, I'm too, I'm too, I, I know you have another thought as well, so I want to let you get in a sec. But um, something that I noticed too, to your point about how these people and the way that they express their, they, they show us what they've been through or don't show us what they haven't been through, rather than hearing about maybe how this abuse affected Juicy in a meaningful way, or maybe seeing the way that his, you know, mom deals with things uh, and maybe that is part of what gets her into the state that she's in rather than her just being very affectionate in one moment and completely withholding in the next for plot reasons. Instead, we just have this big fucking monologue about inherited trauma and how like you've inherited so much trauma. I have too. We all have inherited trauma. I'm like, this is this is just bad, right? This is just straight up not good writing. You need to show me these things. Do not it's tell trendy. me, show me. What happened is these are all trendy topics. So the fact that they're trendy and in the circles that this play is made for, they hear it all the time. I think it's like a borrowed emotional response or a borrowed um, kind of thing where, hey, in our world, this is settled. You know, uh, trauma is inherited and people do after things about trauma. You've seen the other plays that talk about this. So you don't need me to do it. It's almost like a footnote that tells yeah. you, go see this. So there's so many plays and... Uh, tragedy porn black stuff out there that's all about uh intergenerational trauma and you know all these different things i think they're kind of almost treating it like you don't even it's kind of like when you watch one of those marvel movies and it's clear that you're meant to see five other movies yeah and this one yeah <laughs> that's what this felt like like you meant to see five other other things in this genre of black art and if you saw it then you'll know all the shorthands oh intergenerational trauma okay i got it homophobic dad I got it. I've, I've done my homework, you know? But you can signpost those things in a way that doesn't insult the audience's intelligence. You don't have to be that didactic about it. The play, as it began to kind of go along, once once the father, um, the, you know, we, we see the, 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 the dead ghosts and then they establish the whole thing of the, the uncle possibly being the killer and all of that and the mom, you know, they establish a kind of pretense and where we were, we know it's Hamlet, you know, it's, it's synonymous, but different. Once they start kind of going into the trauma stuff and the, and the inherited trauma, I started getting really annoyed because then I realized also the guy doesn't understand Hamlet, the play. Mm. There's a huge element to Hamlet where Hamlet's annoying. Mm -hmm. He's actually a, 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 a the thing that people like kind of focus on about Hamlet is that he's he's indecisive. He's also a brat. He's a spoiled yeah. rich kid. Yeah. Right. And I found it interesting that he seemed to take out all of that stuff. I was like, well, why are we watching essentially like, is, is it, is it like a middle class family? I was like, no, honestly, if you're going to do a black version of Hamlet, you should actually do it with a high class. They should black be rich. Family. Absolutely. They should be super fucking rich. Right. And the kids were bratty. Now, in this play, the kids were bratty, but they were making their brattiness somehow earned because of their generational trauma. And I'm watching it. And I'm just like, 
Stop complaining. Y'all are fucking annoying. Well, and, and as I, bratty kids. <laughs> I, I think too. Yeah. Like just to the point of like, I feel like we do this every time we talk about theater, uh, uh, Trevor, like we always end up thinking about like, what would a good version of this play look like? <laughs> um, right. But like, for one thing, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever that Juicy would be going to the University of Phoenix online. That doesn't track with Hamlet at all. He would be going to no. fucking Harvard or yeah. you could have him go to Howard if you wanted that piece of specificity there. Right. But like, don't make him be going to University of Phoenix and don't make his mom be stealing his tuition money away from him to pay for a grill or whatever. But that makes yeah. no sense. But I think None. in his mind, he was doing subversion, but it didn't matter the subversion made any sense or added anything to it, which, which it didn't. Like, I mean, you, you got to justify these subversions and and none of these subversions improves anything. It, it just kind of right. makes him think, oh, you know, this is black. So... And I want to be like Tyler Perry, so I want to be blue collar people. And I don't care if I'm putting a square peg into a round hole. I'm going to jam this thing in there to to keep um you know up with what I'm doing, which is you know uh you know we still never finished reading this um. <laughs> Wait a minute, there was more? I thought, yeah. that, was I thought that was it too. You I can't do this to me, it. dude. I'll finish it, bro. I'm yeah, yeah. Let me just let me just finish it. I mean, uh, I know that you will meet this play with everything you've experienced getting from point A to this particular point B. Hell, everything you've experienced in your life. You brought what? all of that with you. And I hope this play offers you a space of gratitude. That's true. The woman in front of me was dealing with the trauma from fighting with Bernie Bros and Catholics online. <laughs> that, that you have lived through so much life and still can find corners of yourself that are soft enough to ignite joy. Uh, I love my soft corners. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. My or you know, cor- or you know, whatever your softness gives. Personally, oh my, God. my softness gives laughing. It's giving loud softness and kissing my teeth. But you know, do what feels good, and and that's basically what this is. It's just a giant. It's worse, than I remember it. Oh yes, yeah. it's pretty bad. Uh, but it's just a giant. And, and I always talk to him to me about this about how everything now is made to affirm you. And this whole preamble is just a promise. This is going to affirm you. It's not going to challenge you. That's what softness means. Like whatever troubles you came in with today, this is going to help you deal with them. This is therapy. This is whatever. Like nothing in here is going to challenge you like say the way that the, the dutchman challenges you or something like it's it's just totally like you know we're gonna pander to you and that's fine because that's what people um want nowadays something that crossed my mind too when i was um thinking about this whole thing and and how it was um constructed there is so much gayness in it right and this perfect example of something that you're just doing to subvert stuff but it doesn't to me really fit in with Hamlet, but there's all these plays that Shakespeare has. I think Midsummer Night's Dream is one of them where there's there's gender bending disguises, mm-hmm. men dressed as women at parties. Uh, as You Like women. It is uh, similar in that regard. Yeah, As You Like It. There's a couple of gender bending ones and I'm just thinking the act of being closeted, of performance, like the way um, the soldier comes out at the end and is so unearned and everything. Like, why not just find but I think he doesn't, I think he not only doesn't understand Hamlet, I don't think he probably understands much Shakespeare at all. He just knows Hamlet. No. He just knew Hamlet's the biggest, most serious play that people talk about with Shakespeare. So I'm just going to choose Hamlet because that's the one that is, uh, has the most recognition. That's the one that I want to steal uh, the the borrowed emotional response from. But there's so many other Shakespeare plays that I think would have worked perfectly and seamlessly because first off, they're already comedies. So you wouldn't have to like try to force right. a, a yeah. tragedy to be a comedy. And they would flow so well with the themes of uh, what does gender mean? What does sexual orientation mean? The but Tempest like, would have been better. Mm, that's a good one, too. The Tempest would have been better because a lot of that has to do with, you know, Lenny. That has to do with their lineage yeah. and like, you know, and also children choosing their own pathways from their fathers. You know, like Hamlet doesn't really have anything to do with that. It doesn't really, you know, and it's interesting because he he superficially takes pieces. So I, I think what he then thought was that I can make a, a, a masculinity conversation out of this. Right. So this is what I'll do. I'll, I'll make this into, you know, this whole thing of revenge is some kind of masculine thing. And it's, you know, and, and, and all the conversations around 
what well, I was about to say, and all the comment mm-hmm. around toxic masculinity is what I was going to say. It, it becomes good fodder to like basically write some bullshit and then be soft at the end. You know? <laughs> By the way, speaking of toxic masculinity, speaking of toxic masculinity, I went on um, Show Score, which is one of those sites, if you're not familiar, where people can just leave reviews. It's like IMDb for theater, basically. And half of the fucking comments are talking about how this play is just such an incisive exploration of toxic masculinity. And I'm like, it's just not. I'm sorry, but it's not. It it doesn't, it wants to be that, but it just isn't that. And I think what was really frustrating about it too was that I didn't think that everything about this play was terrible. I thought that like the guy who played Juicy, I liked some, I I thought he was doing the best that he could with what he had to work with, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Um, And the times that he actually started speaking the Shakespeare, because there are a couple moments in here where there are actual excerpts of Hamlet slotted in, he was really good with the language. And it made me remember how much better of a play Hamlet is than what I was watching. And that's <laughs> a problem. Talk. Yeah. Yeah, I I, I found... It's it, it was hard for me to evaluate what the actors were doing. I actually was familiar with one of the actors. He played um, Larry, the the um, oh yeah, which I also want to talk about the um, the, the military guy because that was actually his arc was the arc in the show that made me the most angry. Okay, oh, yeah. interesting. That was the one that I was. A, on like, a, as a writer, as a dramatic writer, it, it, it was totally unearned. But also just this, 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 this way that they do fake culpability. So I felt like mm-hmm. he probably was writing on um, the, the, the writer was probably writing the play and realized that Juicy doesn't have a moment where he looks a little dirty. Yeah. Right. Because yeah. at this point, everything's kind of happening to him and he never really does anything. Right. And I guess in the original, you know, and, and then he goes, he goes back to the original Hamlet where um, the the Hamlet's probably biggest nasty thing is how horrible he is to Ophelia all the time. Right. And 